and figure out a little more reading the passage for us. Haunted by your past. Have you done something in the past and it comes back to haunt you before? Like if you see, watch this in a Hollywood movie, there are a lot of discussed situations. I know what you did in the past, uh, I know what you did last summer and things like this. You know, you come back because of certain crime they have done before, then you come back and those people will come back and haunt them. But if you watch an Asian show, a like Taiwanese show, Korean show, the past will come, come and haunt them in a different way. It will come like something one young man or one young woman appear in front of that house and says, Hi, I'm your son. It's a past. You know, they have some affair outside. You know, then yeah, the, the, the past come back and haunt them. You know, it could be something like this. But for normal life like us, this doesn't really happen. It could be as small thing as what you eat. And after that, it causes a summer day for you. You know, then it's an immediate effect on you. Or you fail to take care of your body. And years after that, you suffer the illness and certain things develop. Now, uh, I, my left would have this constant pain because uh, very many years ago, about 15 years ago, I was playing soccer and I injured my foot, my toe, you know, my left toe, and uh, and I didn't take care of it. And years later, every time when the wind blows at it or background blows at it, my toes would be very painful. I'm suffering the effect of it. My past had come back and haunts me. Uh, it could be bigger issue like. Um, you have offended someone and because you have offended someone and after some time you have to meet that person again you know and your past my past come and haunt us it could be something like this and in this passage today it is something like that Jacob's past come and haunt him and Jacob at the back can you lower the mic because of the echo yeah it's the same Jacob, same Jacob. <laughs> okay let's let Look at the background, okay? Um, chapter 31, which Pastor preached last week, Jacob was running away from Laban, and Laban caught up with him, and they finally settled for an agreement for a covenant, right? And uh, what happened? They have a truce, or more like a ceasefire agreement company. You know, if you take a look at um, chapter 31, verse 47, 48, they make a covenant using a pillar. Can you see the picture here? Uh, uh, and they call it Galit. You remember this delete thing? So it's this quite a pillar there, and then I, I circle that because the painter somehow painted the hand shaky. I don't know whether they, they shake their hand last time, but it, it showed that there's kind of treaty, some kind of like agreement or covenant in between, between them. Okay, and this is what's happened. He was running away from Lebanon, finally made a treaty, set up a, 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 a pillar that says we will have no, we have no fight, and this is, our, this is our witness. Okay, take a look at the back here. This is the direction of where they, where did they make the treaty? Probably around this area. You see, around this area. And uh, he was running away, Laban caught up with him. Something that is okay. And now, Jacob finally reached about reaching the land of Canaan. At least he's close. And he's like moving forward, going home. But actually, when he think he was moving forward, going home, he was actually going back to his past, to meet his past. It was very near Esau's territory. Can you see the map here? So he's moving down, and it was actually near Esau's land of Edom, which is just below here. It was very near to his brother's territory. And if you remember the earlier chapters, uh, he was running away from Esau because he cheated his brother twice. First time for his birthright, second time for his blessing. So Esau was so angry at chapter 27, and Esau wanted to kill him. That's why he ran. He ran all the way up to Haran. But now he has come back. And now he has come back to face his past. His past. And this road is a route of no return. Why? Because at the back of him, here, was a pillar of Galit. And his uncle told him, Levant told him, you don't cross this pillar. You cross means it's hostility. I won't cross it. You don't cross it. So he cannot cross back. He couldn't go back. So he has to move forward. You know, and moving forward means his past will come and haunt him. Laban will be there to, to meet him. So if you take a look at this passage here, chapter 32, Esau's attitude towards uh, is wrong. Jacob's attitude towards Esau was very humble. Verse 4, he called him Lord. 
and um, he called himself servant in verse 4 also. He saw his servant of uh, Esau's servant. He called him not a few times in verse 18, verse 20, he called himself servant again. And even then, verse 5 shows that he made his resources available. He says, I have donkeys, I have flocks and all. No, in, in, so that I may find favour in your sight. He make his own resources, probably thousands of cattle and all this. He make it available for his brother. Wow, he was very, very humble towards his brother. But it was a different attitude he had towards Laban, if you remember. Chapter 31, verse 36, take a look at how he treated Laban. When Laban approached him, accused him of stealing something, he was angry and he scolded Laban. You know, and that was his attitude towards Laban. But towards Esau, he was somehow humble and called himself servant, calling Esau Lord. Why is that so? Why is that a different attitude? Well, towards Laban, it's very easy because he did no wrong. He didn't do any, anything wrong. So his conscience was clear, so he was a bit more aggressive. So he dared to scold Laban. But towards Esau, his conscience is not clear. He had wronged Esau twice. And his past is now haunting him. His conscience is not clear. And now he's entering into this territory which is very near to Esau's territory. So that's why he's entering with fear and trembling. And he's going to visit his past. You can imagine this. It is some, like some of us here, isn't it? I know just a statement for us to think about. In our journey with God, we also have many stressful moments like Jacob. You know, like stressful and fearful moments, like he's entering with, into this territory of fear and trembling. But although, if you take a look at verse 1, God did encourage him. What's the encouragement that he has? Take a look at verse 1 and verse 2, he, he, he met a group of angels. And it's a big group of angels, it's not one single angel, which is probably a messenger. But in this case, he called it Mahanaim, which is two camps, big camps. Camps. One big camp of angelic army. So the Lord was actually assuring Jacob. And I put here Mahanai, two camps, really means his own camp and another big camp over there, which is an angelic camp. It's God's assuring protection and presence for him. God assuring Jacob of his presence for him and his protection. But true enough, Jacob's worst fear came true. Take a look at it, verse 6 to verse 23. At least he thought that was his worst fear. The messenger came back, verse 6, and told Jacob, says, Yeah, I met your brother Esau, and he's coming. Whoa. If Esau heard the news that Jacob is coming back, and he said, Okay, welcome him back, that's it, send the messenger back, well, that'll be fine, isn't it? But then Esau himself is coming with Jacob. Well, that's already scary, isn't it? Because we don't know whether Esau is still angry. But moreover, this is worse. Now Esau is coming with 400 men. That's almost a battalion size. Almost one battalion size of army is coming with him. So I put here, our journey with God is sometimes stressful, and there are, mo there are moments they are fearful also, and it may be overwhelming, definitely overwhelming for Jacob, and it's beyond him to handle this. This is scary, isn't it? Our moment with God also, when we journey with God, there are moments that is overwhelming. There are always moments that will be so stressful that it's truly, truly beyond what we can handle. Remember the words of Paul, 2 Corinthians, you don't have to turn to, I just showed you on the screen. 2 Corinthians, Paul himself said this in our responsive reading. He says, I want you to be aware of my affliction. Paul saying, we, we, the gospel workers of our situation, that we were utterly burdened beyond our strength. What they can handle, and they were totally despaired of life. You see, in Christian life, in the work with God, sometimes we will meet with a situation that is beyond us to handle. And indeed, Paul himself says, this is like a sentence of death. Have you felt that kind of moment before, that you are so stressful, so overly burdened, that you find that, God, I cannot handle this, I cannot handle this. You know, and you can imagine what Jacob is going through in his mind. You know, it's a totally sleepless night. And what did he do? You see, he, he jumped into action the whole night through. What was he doing? So there are a lot of night activities. Verse 13, the whole night he was sorting out 500 animals, 500 plus animals, the sheep cattle, and he was picking those best sheep and sending them out to badgers, 
coordinating the distance. So this, this is, you must imagine, this is a, this a few hours kind of activity. It's not like one, uh, one hour for a few minutes you type on the computer, click, but then the ship's all separated. No, no, it's, it's 500 over animals with cattle and all this. So you must imagine this is it's a long, long hour thing. And the whole night he spent, verse 21 says, the whole night he spent in the camp, he wasn't sleeping. He couldn't sleep. In verse 22, again, he got up and he did something, a, a, a lot more things. He sent his whole family across the river. And you must understand, he's sending across the river, although mentioned over there, four wives, uh, two wives and two maids, and 11 children. You must understand there are a lot more servants, and there are probably thousands more uh, cattle to send this whole entire troop across the river in the middle of the night, pitch dark, is not an easy business. It takes probably another hour's end. All the logistics that he has, all the can, tents, pitch tents, and all the things he had to keep, uh, leave everybody, his children, everyone, and cross the river. This, this is going to be a, a big exercise, actually, a big operation. Everybody cannot sleep, not just him, everybody cannot sleep in the middle of night, wake everybody up, let's go, cross. You know, and why, why, is, why is Jacob so fearful? You have to ask yourself. Well, the reason that he was so fearful, in fact, is not just fearful, verse 7 says, he was greatly afraid. He was not just afraid, but greatly afraid and distressed. Because of his own life, because he was afraid that Esau would attack him. But more than that, if it's just him, he could run by himself. Like the last time, he ran to have have uh, run himself. But now he has wives and children. He's not by himself, and he has all his thousands of flocks, his cattle, and his servants all under him. So I must see that our stressful and fearful moments, I put there, have ill effects on us and others. And it's true, isn't it? Nobody gets to sleep. This fearful and uh, stressful moment affects us emotionally, probably affect our health as well, and you affect other people, affect other people's emotion as well. It, it's not a, a, just a you alone thing. You know? So we may have moments like this, that we are fearful, we are stressed, and everyone else around us are all affected. What will you do under such stress? What will you do when your life is threatened? What will you do when your family's lives are threatened? Or all that you have accumulated, your wealth, your possessions are threatened? What will you do? But most of us probably we don't face such life-threatening situations, is it? Most of us do. I have a classmate. His name is Michael. For the first 16 years of his life, he stayed in Indonesia, Jakarta. But his, his hometown is about two hours away from Jakarta. And uh, if you remember, in 1998 there was a racial riot, religious riot, racial riot, it's an interlink company. And the majority race in Indonesia root, raped, killed many Chinese, especially Christians. Remember that in 1998? My friend Michael, but then in 1998 he was only 16 years old. And he was living in that, that place. And his place uh, two hours drive away from Jakarta, the main city, he was a uh, majority Chinese resident living in the area. And from his flat, he could actually see the trucks coming in. And he received news that from Jakarta, the main city, there were truck loads of rioters coming towards their city, knowing that that city is mainly Chinese, that that town was mainly Chinese. So from his, his house, he could actually see those truck loads coming in, and the people uh, loading off. And they're going to kill, and they're going to rape, and they're going to loot everything that they have. You know, if you remember, this was a scene at the time. And, and this is the actual picture that was taken by a uh, uh, journalist. You know, and there were worse pictures that I, I, I think we'd better go and show them. And he's, he, Michael, my friend, he was the only 16 year old guy uh, around in his home. He has two other younger siblings and his mom. You know, and he was the oldest guy. His dad was not around in the area. At the time, his dad was in church, uh, uh, quite a distance away. So his dad called him. It's a scary moment. It's a scary moment for him. So his dad called him from church and says, "Michael, get ready the parangs underneath the bed. You know what the parangs? They actually keep these parangs underneath the beds. See, Michael, get ready the beds. So Michael was like, he's only 16 year old guy. If they break through the door, 
he has to protect his whole family. The kind of situation he has to go through. You, you must think this is this is a kind of stressful situation for a 16-year-old man at the time. You know, and it's something like this what Jacob is going through. You know, and it's stressful when your life is threatened. And uh, but most of us may not face the kind of situation. We may not. But we may face other kind of life-threatening situation, or maybe not life-threatening, even stressful situation. Like maybe it's health-related, maybe it's your work, maybe it's some relationship that you have is stressful, family situation or financial situation at the home. It could be stressful for us. And sometimes we're not just thinking about ourselves, also our family. What will you do under stressful situation like this? What will you do if you are in Michael Shoe or you are in Jacob Shoe? What will you do? Let's see what Jacob did. Jacob immediately sprang into action. Verse 7. He divided his whole entire family household into two. That takes a lot, a lot of time. You must, you must understand. There are thousands of flocks, hundreds of servants, and all. So it sounds logical. So he divided them into two. He said, if one gets attacked, the other one can escape. You know, that's what he was thinking about. But over here, we must notice that Jacob forgot something. He forgot something. He forgot what he saw at verse 1 and verse 2. The manna, mahanai. He forgot the camp that he saw. He divided his possession. And the scripture read it in a, in a very interesting way. It says he divided his, his family into two camps. And this is what really verse 2 means. Mahanai really means two camps. He forgot there were already two camps. He could divide his family into two camps, but they're already two camps. His own camp, which is a big camp, and there's another big camp. Something like this. I don't know this not, I don't know whether this is the best picture to show, but there were two camps already. His camp, hundreds of people, thousands of cattle with his family. And there were another big camp that he saw in verse 1 and verse 2. The angelic camp. There was and camels of the angels to protect him. He has forgotten about it. He was so anxious, he was under stress, and he acted first. He just sprang into action. He made plans. Many of us are like that, where we are under stress. We make plans. We work through the night. We, like, like Jacob, work through the night. And we spring into action to get things in place. But don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that when we are under stress, we don't do anything at all. We just sit there. And that's not what I mean. You know, we are not just to sit there and, and wait for disaster to come upon us. No, that's not what I mean. Also. But what is wrong with Jacob? Section. What is wrong with this section? Well, I put here his first thing become the second thing. The first thing, the most important thing, which is prayer, become the second thing. He sprang to action first. You know, and in the, then after that, then he turned to God. Well, he's supposed to turn to God first and pray first. And in fact, God has assured him of his presence and protection. Remember the Mahanai? And this God will care for him. Well, he did pray. Later we will see a look at a prayer. But that was not his first action. First thing he did was to divide his possession. And later it seems that this division doesn't, uh, doesn't have any effect. In fact, it was some hints that after that he brings everybody back again. Verse 13, he has to go, go around his flocks and air to choose the best gift for Esau. Then after that, he has to send the whole camp across the river in verse 22 to 23. It seems that he, he hints that he, he brings prophet everybody again. And there's no mention of these two camp formation after that anymore. Not even the next chapter. The next chapter, he will bring all them to his family again. So it's, it's an organization that is an extra action, but he has to undo later. He's like, under stress, he could do something which he later find like, probably no, no help, and he will do everything, undo everything again. You know, so <clears throat> under stress, sometimes we are very quick to act. Our first thing, most important thing, become the last thing or the second thing, which is prayer. <clears throat> how should we respond? Well, remember the, in the responsive reading again, how did Paul respond? Let me show you the verse again. Oh, this one you did. <clears throat> Verse 9, he says that indeed we felt that 
we received the sentence of death and said, get up, verse 9. They took a look at behind your uh, uh, outline. He says that, but that was, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. When Paul was facing uh, that kind of stressful moment, beyond what he can bear, Paul says, that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. That's what supposed to Jacob supposed to turn to God first, the dependence on God in prayer. And in fact, later Paul says, well, verse 11 says, you must help us, you also must help us by prayer. So importance of prayer, so that we'll give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted to us through prayers of many. So the importance of turning to God, the importance of relying on God. That's the first thing first. And, but to give Jacob the credit, he did pray. Let's take a look at his prayer in verse 9 to verse 11. And his prayer could be easily finished reading in one minute or less than a minute. As compared to what he did in dividing the frogs and his family into two camps, it would probably take hours to do that. So, nevertheless, this is a good prayer. Take a look at it, verse 9. Jacob remembered God as a covenant God. He says, God of Abraham, God of Jacob. Jacob also recognized that his own unworthiness, verse 10, and God's grace to him. He says, I only left the place with one star, but now you have blessed me with two camps again. You know, because he divided his people into two. And verse 11, Jacob asked for help. He says, God, please help me. I'm fearful of you, so please save me. And verse 12, Jacob remind, reminded God of his promise. He said, you are the one who promised me that I will have offspring right. Uh, send up a seashore and it will be numbered from all the Jews. So say, you, you are the one who promised me all this. It's a good prayer. It's a good prayer that he, he remind, remember of who he is, who he was and who God was. But still, if you look at the prayer, the prayer never asked God what to do, what he should do. Can you see that? He still did not ask God what action he should take. Immediately after prayer, verse 13 to verse 21, he sprang into actions again. You know, he selected a choice animal, five, more than 500 of them, and sent them in droves, which means in badges with servants guiding them, and in keeping a distance. And all this, you must understand, is all done in the dark. Probably like this, uh, I've sent in droves. But this picture is not the best picture, but it's the best picture I can find. Because it's all supposed to be done in the dark. So it's not an easy thing. And in fish like, they don't have street lamps, they don't have like, some super touch light to show everything. No, it's all done, done, done in the dark. So this is probably taking hours for him to believe all this. And he spent the action in verse 22 to 23. Then he brings his whole family across the stream and the rest of his thousands of flocks and servants. This will all again take hours. And by now, by now, Jacob, his whole family will be very tired and it's a very unsettling night, isn't it? So what do you see? What do you see in this picture when he's do all these things in the dark, he cannot sleep, he just organized everything. What do you see here? You see someone who was haunted by his past. His sin was catching up with him. He felt the guilty conscience in him. He was immobilized, affected his whole family about his past sin. Is it? But sometimes we believers are also like that, isn't it? We are also like him. We are also immobilized by our own past sin. Right? It could be seen that we've done years ago, it could be seen that we've done months ago, or just weeks ago, or maybe just days ago. You know, and sometimes this coming back of this sin keep haunting us. We are stressed by it, we are immobilized by it. I met one someone, he's a preacher, young man. He met me for breakfast, and uh, he is a good preacher. He is a good preacher. And, uh, um, he go around to different churches to preach as well. And so he met me and he told me that he sometimes he feel that he shouldn't be preaching because of some sin that he had done in the past. You know, so he was immobilized, almost immobilized by his past sin. You know, so we should, we should actually of course spring the action to correct our sin the things that we have done in the past, but we must always remember that is not the first thing that we should do. What should be the first thing? I put here, the first thing we should do, number one, you see one, because it's the first thing that we are haunted by our past, turn to God who cares for us. We should pray. We should pray. Second, 
we should repent if we have not done so. We should repent of no sin if we have not done so. And third, we must remember the gospel of grace. We must remember the gospel. For example, the flesh is passage to you. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Yes. When we turn to God, to repent, we must remind ourselves the gospel of grace. 1 Corinthians is a little bit small. 6, 9 to 11, it says here, Do you not know? Sorry, I, I skip it. It says, Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, that could be your past sin, sexual sin, idolaters, those who worship idols, adultery, those who are not faithful to their husband or wife, or men who practice homosexuality, thieves, the greedy, the drunkard, the reviler, those who are violent, the swindler, those who cheat money, will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are all the past sins the Corinthian church. Uh, were actually, actually practicing. That is what they were like. And these are sins that would disqualify them from the kingdom of God. But verse 11 says, but such were some of you. It was in the past. Can you see it's a past then? But such were some of you. So remember the gospel of grace. Do not let our past sin immobilize us. Because when Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago, He paid for our past sin. He paid for our present sin. And He paid for our future sin as well. And when Satan, the devil, when the world, or even our own conscience, stand for God and worship Him, what should we do? We should turn around and talk back to them using this verse and say, Jesus paid it all. My God has paid all these things. And we should let this, this song, a very beautiful song, remind us. I just, I just quote one, one paragraph of the sentence. Since when Satan tempts me to despair of our past sin and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see Jesus there. He made an end to all my sin. Jesus has washed away our sin. That's what the verse says, actually. There are three things that the verse says. Jesus washed, that's what for some of you, Jesus washed away our sin. He cleared our guilt. Second, so He sanctified us. He made us holy, set apart that we can be used by God again. Although we are not a usable vessel, but God will use us again because He set us apart. And lastly, He justified us. We are forever accepted by God. When we repent, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, He will help us. He will help us to live a life that is pleasing to God again. We should remind ourselves of this gospel of grace when we are immobilized by our past sin. In our walk with God, there are times that we will be fearful and stressed, and this journey home towards heaven, in this stress, some distressful moment may even be beyond what we can handle, and sometimes it's because of the past guilt that we have, past sin that we've done. But you must remember, when these things meet us again, it's because God is not done with us, just like God is not done with Jacob. Take a look at verse 24 to 32, when we are broken. You must imagine now at this point, Jacob is super stressed, super tired also. Right? The whole night of activity, hours of arranging his family, bring them across the river, packing up everything. After the two major exercises, dividing his family, the second, three actually, dividing his family, after sending badges of gifts, third, bring the whole jing gang across the river, he must be tired. And very stressed, and he was as he was walking in the darkness, pitch darkness. Remember again, no street lights. Tired of all these things, he was left alone. Verse twenty-four, and he was probably left alone to think of maybe new strategies again. Maybe he was thinking of what to do again, new plans. And suddenly, someone came and grabbed him in the dark. You don't see any. It's pitch dark. Somebody came and grabbed him. The the best you have is only the moonlight. And what did he do? He ended up wrestling with this person. Can you see verse 24? He says, A man wrestled with him. It's not he wrestled with the guy. It's this guy came and wrestled him. He was a passive form. He was a passive one. So that man, in the verse he says, came, he took the initiative to wrestle him. And they wrestled for a long, long time. Verse 24 tells us, they wrestle till daybreak, at least probably a few hours, probably. 
You must have you ever tried wrestling before? Playing, playing wrestling. It's very tiring. It's very tiring. I tried before. You know, I, I tried wrestling before with friends. With friends. Uh, last time when I was younger, 15 years younger, I wrestled with Adrian, so he's not here to be here. Uh, he was then also younger, like, so two of us wrestled on the floor and was so tired. All sweat all over, but none of us win, so we were just <laughs> wrestling on the fly. That was 15 years ago. Okay, now, <clears throat> you don't need to do anything, you dislocate my both arms and legs. Okay, <clears throat> so what happened? He was wrestling for hours, it must be a very tiring thing, and Jacob never gave up. Jacob did not want to lose. This is what Jacob was like, isn't it? In his whole life, he never wanted to lose. From birth, when his brother Esau came up, he grabbed his brother's heel. And that's why he, called, he, he was called Jacob, a heel grabber. And when he, he, he grew up, he never wanted to lose. He stole his brother's birthright. He never wanted to lose. He cheated. Later, he cheated his brother's blessing. But he always wanted to win, and he wanted to win very badly. Now, someone wrestled him, and he wrestled back for a long time. Something like this. I mean, I, I was trying to look for what? Some kind of pictures. So, it was like wrestling. I don't know whether this is the best picture, the wings are still there for the angels, I don't know. And, and this person that he wrestled with is most likely an angel. At whatever he, whoever he is, he's either an angel, most likely he's an angel. If you took a look at, um, you don't have to turn to, just put a um, reference somewhere. Hosea chapter 12, verse 4, he will tell you that the angel, he wrestled with the angel of God. And he wrestled, and this angel represents God. And he wrestled, when he wrestled with AJ, he was actually wrestling God. And he never wanted to lose. And it seems, it somehow, it seems that Jacob knows that this is God himself, or the representative of God himself, at least an angel. He knows. He knows this is someone who represents God. Because this, that's not the first time he has met an angel, isn't it? You know, earlier on, he had met an angel in his dreams. And, uh, two chapters ago, he also met an angel, an angel giving instruction about the sheep. So, and chapter, verse 1 also, he met a group of angels. So it's not the first time he met an angel or an agent of God. It's not the first time. And somehow he knew also in later verse, in verse 26, he's asking, uh, bless me, unless you bless me. So he was asking for someone who was more superior to bless him, who is someone of a lower rank. So he knows that someone, it is someone that he wrestled with, God or a representative of God. And he struggled with God. He struggled with Him and he still wants to win. Can you see? He wants to win very badly in his life. And he struggled for a long time. This is like us, isn't it? Isn't it like us? In life, many times we are like Jacob. We struggle. We struggle with people because we want to win and we struggle with God because we want to be in control. We want to be in control. And long struggling, especially I put here, in life we struggle with God in a lot of times, maybe not all the times, but in a lot of times, it's because of sin and disobedience. We struggle with God, especially in sin, we will struggle with God for a long, long time, and we will not give up. There's some sin that we want to hold on to, and when God wants us to break free, we will struggle with God, because we want to be in control. Right? What should we do? Well, we should stop, stop struggling and submit to God. We should stop struggling and submit to God. If there are some relationship in our life we know that we should not pursue, we should stop struggling with God and submit. If there are some sinful habits in our life, some addictions that we need to break free, then we must stop struggling with God and we must submit to Him. Or if there are some pursuit of some kind of idolatry in our life, then we must repent, we must stop struggling with God. Why? Because God always has His own ways. God always has His ways. His ways, perfect way and good way, will always win, every time. God has not done with Jacob, remember? What did God do in the struggle? You take a look at the verse, God touched the hip of Jacob's, uh, Jacob's hip, and He broke Jacob's he dislocated Jacob's he. God will win. God's will will win. He will break Jacob's will. And Jacob the grabber, God will break his will. And only when Jacob was broken or dislocated, then Jacob become desperate. He cling on to God and says, Bless me. Unless you bless me. 
And after that, you see that Jacob was changed. I put that. After when, only after when Jacob was dislocated, Jacob was changed. How do you know he was changed? God renamed him. The angel turned around and renamed him and says, you are no longer Jacob, you are no longer that supplanter, that person who grabbed and always want to be. You are no longer that person. But you become Israel. And what's the meaning of Israel? Well, a lot, if you take a look at your Bible footnotes, there are two possible meanings. He who strives with God. But there's a second meaning. God strives. That is a better meaning, actually. God strives. God wins. God triumphs. God prevails over. God has things His way. This is a better meaning. So you may always want to win, always want to be in control, but you must understand God is in control. God strives and God will prevail. And what do you see after that? A picture of Jacob like this. A man limping. He became a lame person. Literally, not that he after that started telling him jokes, but he, he became lame, literally. So what do you see? A person like Jacob. Now, in being witness, a witness, actually no, strong person, because he clinged on to God, and he asked God for blessing. He began to depend on God, that's where the strength of a person really comes from. It's not when the person is standing tall, he all depends on himself. When the person is broken, then he learns to depend on God. He's no longer like himself, used to, who will plan and strategize everything. He prayed, yes, but that was not his first action. You, you saw that just now. And he began to cling on God. And let me remind us that only when we are spiritually dislocated, then we learn to depend on God. And I put here as when we are defeated. Only when we are defeated, then we learn to seek God. Only when we are defeated, then we learn to seek God. I do not know how many of you have this kind of experience before. Only when you are defeated, then you begin to turn to God. When I was in my NS days, not long ago, uh, about 19 years old, 1920 years old, about two years ago, there was uh, 20 years ago. <coughs> More than 30 years ago, and I was in my NS training. I was doing very well um, in my specialist course, my commander course, the uh, CISPEC course. I was doing so well that even external examiner came and observed, and my direct commander was so proud of me. I was one of the top trainee at the time, and they wanted me to cross over to an officer course. You know, and I was so proud, so self dependent at the time. I was like, wow, everything you can do. Until my final exercise, it was in the dark at the gong, pitch dark. I'm supposed to topo to one place, um, navigate to one place and do an enemy attack. I lost my way. I let my section go somewhere far away. I lost my way and my commander was so angry with me and I, finally I brought to a point to charge an enemy. I charge him, let my, my uh, platoon to charge him, I charge him to my commander. That, not the enemy, the enemy was dead and charged me because it was speech that I met my, my, my charge my commander look, 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 people charging at me but my commander was so angry he was grabbing for something to throw at me oh, then I was, that night was really horrible and everything was messy I remember that night because it was speech down by the the at the night I took my rifle, I put on my left and I kneeled down and I prayed it was only when I was so broken and I ask God, help me. It's, it's only sometimes when we are broken, when we are defeated, then we learn to turn to God. And this is not only the first horror story in my life, there are other stories I think I will not say, but um, this is something that we must think about here. So in summary of this passage, in our walk with God, there may be fearful and stressful moments, and some of these fearful and stressful moments uh, it could be beyond what we could handle. And sometimes, or maybe a few more times, it could be because of our past sins and our past guilt that come back to haunt us. And when these things happen, remember that God is not done with us yet, just like God is not done with Jacob in this passage. God is still working in us. And 
Many times it's because God needs to dislocate us. God needs to break us. Break our stubborn will. Especially when we want to wrestle with Him for a long time. God needs to dislocate us spiritually. He needs to defeat us. He needs to defeat our perfect plan for our future, our selfish pursuit for our life, for our family even. He needs to defeat our sinful and disobedient will. So that we learn to depend on Him and we learn to submit to Him. So to remind us what we should do, do not take things into your own hand when you are under the kind of stressful moment, when you have moments that you find that it's beyond you. Don't spring into action first. What should we do? We should turn to God and pray first. We should turn to God and pray first. And if it's because of our past sin, if it's because of our passing, our, our failure on our part to bring our children, our failure on our part to do our business properly, our failure on our part to, 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 to do our relationship or to, to conduct ourselves properly, let, remember the gospel of grace. Do not let it immobilize you. Remember what Jesus has done for you on the cross and He paid for our sin. And at the same time, lastly, I should put there, we should search our heart and stop wrestling. We should search our heart, is it because of some disobedient, some willfulness in us, some sin in us that God is working on, and stop wrestling with God. Because God, remember, God always has His ways. Yes, then we should repent and submit to Him. Then we will be a new person. Look broken, but a better person, a stronger person. Looks like we are living, but we are stronger because we are leaning on God. Let's pray, shall we? We pray that God in moments that we are stubborn, you will break us. So that we Lord, we will learn to depend on you. We will learn to submit to you. We pray that God in times when we are so weak, you will strengthen us by the power of your spirit to overcome sin and our self-will. Thank you for hearing us. We pray this in Jesus' name.